Lynn Marie Trotty is an Associate Professor of Neurology at Emory University, where she also completed her Neurology Residency and Sleep Medicine Fellowship and Masters in Clinical Research. Clinically, her sleep medicine practice is focused on the treatment of people with hypersomnolence disorders. Her research work focuses on the pathophysiology and treatment of the central disorders of hypersomnolence through clinical trials, imaging studies, and other clinical studies. She is a member of the Hypersomnia Foundation's Medical Advisory Board. Thank you, Dr. Trotty. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am so excited to be here um, on Idiopathic Hypersomnia Awareness Day, no less. Um, so I am gonna talk about the impacts of idiopathic hypersomnia, just so you know, Almost every drug I mentioned is not FDA approved for the treatment of IH. We use a lot of off-label drugs. I'd just like to be transparent about that fact. Also, um, in addition to volunteering for the Hypersomnia Foundation, I am a member of the board of directors of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. But please know that anything that I say today is only my deeply held opinion and has nothing to do with my work on the AASM. All right. So, I've spoken at this conference a few years in a row now, and how I like to approach it generally is I say to our organizers, what do you want me to talk about? And I let them tell me what they want me to talk about. And this time they said, we want you to talk about the impacts of IH and maybe especially focus some on brain fog. And I said, great, I will do that. What they did not say was, and your talk is gonna follow a documentary <laughs> where, <laughs> where someone First of all, probably makes everyone in the audience cry, but secondly, describes the impacts of idiopathic hypersomnia better than you possibly ever could. So I'm a physician, I'm a researcher. I do not have idiopathic hypersomnia. I am not here today to tell anyone what it is like to live with idiopathic hypersomnia. You all are definitely the experts in that. What I'm hoping to accomplish today is to sort of give a perspective of how those of us in, in the clinical and research side of things perceive the impacts of IH. And, and also I think maybe to normalize some things. So for people who are relatively new to the diagnosis in the room, you may not really know what's IH and what's not IH. For people who've had IH for years, you might not know what's IH and what's not IH. I think people come to me a lot and say, I do X, Y, and Z, I experience X, Y, and Z, is that normal? Nothing about IH is normal, but some things are typical of IH and some things aren't. And so I think it can kind of help to have a sense that like you're not alone in the symptoms of IH. Uh, and, and I think uh, Beth really said it more beautifully than I ever could a, a minute ago. I think it's really important to separate out what is the disease and what is you, and remember those are different things. <laughs> and so part of what I talk about symptoms which is just to remind everybody, these are symptoms of a disease that you happen to have um, rather than any kind of uh, internalized personal failing, which I think is hard sometimes for people to not end up in that road. So anyway, I am definitely approaching this from a doctor view, not telling anyone else what it is like to uh, live with IH. All right, fundamentally, idiopathic hypersomnia can impact everything. It is pervasive uh, because life activities require you to be awake and alert. It really can bleed over into any aspect of life. Um, as, as physicians, we sometimes uh, need to support people in getting disability or accommodations. And the forms will always ask, well, which specific life activities are impacted by this disease? And I always say, all of them. Um, this is, a, this is a graphic from a review article where they were talking about diagnostic tools for hypersomnia, and I'm not really going to talk much about diagnostic tools today, um, but what I like about this graphic is really just the reminder that IH is everywhere. There's no time on the clock that IH is not a part of. There's long sleep at night for many people. There's a lot of difficulty waking up in the morning for a lot of people, and then during the day, flipping back between sort of a low arousal, constantly not fully awake state and a more uh, severe sleepiness state and napping during the day. I don't think it proceeds in a pretty circle like it does in this graph. I think there's a lot of ups and downs during the day. And as you heard from Beth, a lot of unpredictability that contributes to the difficulty of managing symptoms. 
So the most unsurprising thing I'm going to say today is that quality of life, if you give people scales and you ask them about their quality of life, which we do in all kinds of medicine, quality of life is reduced for people with IH. What you're looking at in the graph is uh, really from three different studies, all using slightly different measures to look at quality of life. The IH people are in the lighter blue controls, whatever they were in the studies are in the darker blue. And you see across the board, Again, unsurprisingly, unfortunately, quality of life is reduced in people who have IH. Um, what I think is interesting about these studies is that it's not just sleepiness that predicts that poor quality of life. Sleepiness does contribute to poor quality of life, although depending on the study and how they measure it, lesser or, or more, more so. But a lot of the other symptoms and impacts of IH are driving the, the poor quality of life as well, um, which... I think as somebody on the research and clinician side of things, um, really is just a reminder that we can't just focus on sleepiness. We have to focus on the whole picture of IH or we're not really gonna make people better. That's not to say sleepiness is not important. So uh, in the transportation in industry for reasons that are not clear to me, they use the word fatigue when they mean the word sleepiness. They do this all over North America. This is a sign from uh, Canada where I'm from. Just these roadsides pop up everywhere telling you to pull over because sleepiness um, is really dangerous when you're driving. So sleepiness is really important in IH. We know that sleepiness um, contributes to driving safety risks, other safety risks in people with IH. And so I don't mean to minimize sleepiness, but I'm mostly not gonna talk about sleepiness today. That's a sort of core fundamental feature of IH and that's the thing we tend to target with our medications. So what are the symptoms beyond sleepiness in idiopathic hypersomnia? So you have to be sleepy by definition and your sleep durations either have to be normal or they have to be long, they can't be short at the time of diagnosis to get a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. But there's a couple of other symptoms that are not mandatory. There are people who have IH who don't have them, um, but are very, very common. Um, so one is severe prolonged sleep inertia, which we'll talk about in a minute. And related to that is long, unrefreshing naps. And then there's lots of other common symptoms that go along with it. Again, not everybody with IH has them, things like cognitive dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, and fatigue. And I really want to sort of peel, uh, go through these one at a time and uh, talk about them in IH. So first of all, long sleep durations. So there's a lot of debate about how we should define long sleep durations, how we should measure long sleep durations um, in, in the field. What you're looking at in the, um, in the figure on top is, is three different protocols from three different places in Europe about how we should diagnose long sleep durations in people with IH. Should we put them in forced bed rest for 32 hours and see how much they sleep? Or should we do uh, more of a nighttime and a couple of naps protocol? Uh, there's lots of debate about this. And depending on how you do it, the abnormal cutoff varies a little bit. Here in the US, those are harder to do. So we tend to use uh, wristwatch-based devices that kind of pretend that if you're not moving, you're asleep. And if you are moving, you're awake, which is an assumption that is not 100% true, um, but is a useful surrogate. We, uh, many people in the room probably know that one of the things the Hypersomnia Foundation did um, a number of years ago was launch a patient registry. There's lots of studies of IH that are from one clinic. It's like here in my clinic, my patients with IH look like this. And then somebody else says here in my clinic, my patients with IH look like this. But by their very nature, they're small and they don't really capture the full picture of IH. And so the registry was a worldwide internet anybody could join if they had IH or related disorders and to really help us understand IH in a sort of a bigger picture, more uh, broad way. Um, and so we uh, published data from just the first time people entered the uh, registry questionnaire a few years ago. Um, and we used a cutoff of 10 hours of sleep in a 24 hour period to define long sleep. And you can see those numbers in the figure, it was right about half and half for people in the registry having long sleep or having normal sleep durations. Long sleep durations have a big impact because of course you just have fewer hours during the day to do anything that you need to do when you're awake. There's this old term called sleep drunkenness, which um, comes from a very, very early description of what turned out to be idiopathic hypersomnia. So 
Guy Bedrick Roth um, was really considered to be the sort of the scientific father of, of IH. He's the one who really published about it and described it um, in, in the earliest reports. And in addition to describing IH, he described this thing which he called hypersomnia with sleep drunkenness, which were people who just couldn't wake up. They the process of going from being asleep to being awake would take hours and hours. They were clumsy. They were uh, confused. They really, really struggled to wake up. And some people that was even worse than their sleepiness. And ultimately he decided, oh, wait, <laughs> that is IH. These are all the same people. Let's, let's put these together. Um, we know that in, in healthy people who don't have any sleep disorders, there is a normal transition between being asleep and being awake called sleep inertia. It's usually very, very short. It's why alarms have snooze buttons on them. Um, but for many people with idiopathic hypersomnia, this is very, 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 very pronounced um, beyond what we would see in uh, healthy people. There's a number of ways that we capture this, but if you're trying to figure out what it is exactly that I'm talking about, what I've highlighted here are some of the questionnaires that we use, some of the tools we use when we're trying to diagnose or measure IH symptoms um, to get at this symptom. And so these are things like, is it impossible for you to wake in the morning without many alarms or without another person? Uh, how long does it take you to feel like you're functioning properly after you wake up? And is it like five minutes or is it like three hours? Um, are you irrational or clumsy right after waking up? Sleep inertia can happen after naps as well. Um, in the Hypersomnia Foundation Registry, we defined it as difficulty waking and functioning with normal alertness. Um, and in that registry, um, for our you know, 400 some IH patients, 79% of them reported sleep inertia. So not everybody has it, but if you have it as part of your IH, you're certainly in good company. It's one thing to ask people if they have a hard time waking up and that's very useful and we do that all of the time and that helps us understand people's sleep inertia. Um, but uh, we like to measure things also uh, in medicine. And so um, there's uh, a lot of work going on to try to figure out the best way to capture that sleep inertia with a uh, with an objective tool. So my video is not working this morning, but this is um, a test called the PVT or the psychomotor vigilance test. Uh, anyone who's been to Atlanta has probably done this. Um, it is a 10 minute test where um, you watch that little uh, horizontal screen there. And then as soon as a number shows up, you press the button as quickly as you can. And it tells you how quickly you did it. And you do it for 10 minutes in a row, you just sit there and press the button every time the number comes up. And it's designed to be really boring and it is really boring, um, but it sort of brings out people's sleepiness because it's very hard to attend to that and not fall asleep. Um, there's lots of measures we get from that, but one is a lapse, which is how many times did it take at least a half a second to press the button? It shouldn't take a half a second to press a button really ever for anyone. Um, what you're looking at in the figure that flat line on the bottom of each graph, those are people who are not sleepy. They do really well pressing the button. They don't have a lot of lapses before they take a nap. And then after they take a nap, we wake them up and hand them the device to do it right after their nap. They're really good at pressing the button. They don't get any worse with napping. That's what we expect to see. In contrast, our IH people are those dotted lines there. Um, and what you see is even when they're just at their sort of wake baseline, it's really hard for them to press the button regularly because they're either falling asleep or not paying attention. They have lapses in vigilance related to their sleep disorder. But even after less than 15 minutes of sleep, they get even worse. So that's the sleep inertia. It's like you're even worse after you wake up than you were right before you fell asleep. So that is obviously a problem in and of itself. Uh, it, it is another thing that eats away at the number of good functional hours that people have. Um, but it also can have some impacts because people have to adopt uh, coping strategies to be able to manage it. So what you're looking at here is um, from a series of patients and then people without IH, just uh, being asked questions about how they wake up and the IH patients are in, in the darker gray. Um, the things that work for people who aren't sleepy uh, don't tend to help for people with IH. Like habit, habit. <laughs> waking up at the same time every day works pretty well for many people actually. It doesn't work great for people with IH, but what does tend to work is things like another person. 
So I have lots of patients who rely on another person to help them wake up. And those patients I know are very grateful that they have supporters who are willing to do that for them and are part of this experience with them. At the same time, it's a big ask to like need another person to wake you up every single day. And so part of the impact of sleep inertia is just the missing time. And part of it is you really become sometimes dependent on another person um, to help manage it. Cognitive symptoms are also really common even after you get out of that period of, of immediately waking up. And so this was from one of the early series of um, IH patients um, described in, in France, where they, again, compared people with IH to people who didn't have any sleep disorders um, and found that people with IH reported more problems with their memory, more problems with their attention. They couldn't concentrate as many hours in a row. Aging stimulating tasks and IH patients could concentrate at most an hour. So much narrower window over there. Um, and then things like misplacing objects. We asked in the hypersomnia registry um, how many people had problems with memory at least once a day. Um, and uh, of our IH people, 72% uh, reported problems with memory at least every day. So very, very common. What do we know from the science, from the research studies about cognitive impairment in IH? Almost nothing. So this is one of the areas where we really, really, really need better data, uh, more of it. We need more studies of it. The graph that you are looking at is a way of summarizing studies and data to say um, both how many of these things have been looked at and when they looked at it, did they find a problem? So anything that's in gray, nobody's ever looked at in IH, which is like, there's a lot of gray on that picture. Um, anything is in yellow, it's been looked at and it's pretty bad in people with IH. It's severely impaired in people with IH. So we haven't looked at a lot of things, but everything we've looked at so far, particularly vigilance, attention, and alertness are, are pretty impaired. And this includes the the PVT, the button pressing test um, that, um, that I showed you. There's a little bit more information in people with narcolepsy type one. We don't have enough studies in people with narcolepsy type one either, don't get me wrong. Um, but at least in terms of cognition, it's been a little bit more studied than it's been studied in people with IH. Um, and you, you still see definite problems with attention and um, vigilance and alertness, just like you do in IH. But what you also see is across a lot of different cognitive domains, there are impairments. And I know they're really small on here. Um, the, the point is it's not just attention. It's not just memory. Broadly speaking, in people with narcolepsy, there's lots of different ways that cognition is impaired. I think what we're going to find when people do the studies is a similar picture in IH, that cognition is broadly impacted. It is not just a single domain where they, you know, people are bad with attention or are falling asleep, but that you're going to see bigger impairments um, in, in people with IH too. And I think that partly because I talk to a lot of people with IH, but partly because um, so far, um, when, when people have looked at the same thing in people with IH and narcolepsy type one, they look about the same. That should say narcolepsy type one on the heading, by the way. Uh, but what you're looking at here is um, an attention task on the um, left and then that PVT again on the right, just to make the point that people with IH and people with narcolepsy type one on the tests that we know about that we've studied so far have pretty similar um, impairments. This was a really interesting study, sort of getting at the question of, okay, beyond like a reaction time or a simple cognitive task, or even beyond just like memory, broadly speaking, can we look at what exactly is going wrong with cognition in people with narcolepsy and IH? And in this case, they compared people with narcolepsy type one to people with IH and narcolepsy type two together, about as many in, in each group. And that's the other CDH group on the figure and then controls who were not sleepy. And basically it was a test where you had to pick between two meaningless symbols, but there was a sort of a right answer that you didn't know. And so you had to learn how to detect what the right answer was. Um, and sometimes you would gain money if you were right. And sometimes you would lose money if you were wrong and sometimes nothing happened. 
Um, and basically what they found was, you know, people without sleep disorders are pretty much equally good at learning from gaining money or learning from losing money in this task. It doesn't matter. They can sort of learn with the same accuracy. But the sleepy people actually really learned much better from earning money. And they didn't learn as much from the negative, um, from having money taken away. You know, I, I don't know that that has a direct extension to the everyday lived life of people with IH. It's just to say, I think the differences in cognition are maybe more subtle um, than just saying, oh, it's a, a problem of attention or a problem of memory. In this particular study, they did find that that problem with learning was related to how sleepy people were, which suggests that at least for this, if we can fix the sleepiness, we may be able to fix the cognition. Um, that is, I don't think, a uh, necessarily true statement for every co uh, cognitive domain impacted by IH. I'm talking about brain fog now in the cognitive section because brain fog for some people probably has a lot to do with cognition. So brain fog is a term that is very widely used and it's very evocative and it's very specific when people use it, right? When someone is sitting in front of me and they're describing their brain fog, <laughs> Uh, I, I get a detailed sense of what their brain fog is. But we're not sure that everybody is using the term to describe the same thing. And so this makes it really hard to study because we're not sure what it is. So what you're looking at here is not from an IH study. It's not from a narcolepsy study. Um, it's actually from a study of Reddit posts. Um, but I liked the, the cleverness of the methodology, which is basically they took a whole week of Reddit posts and anyone that in that week described their own experience of brain fog with any kind of descriptor, they looked at it. And about half of those people had an illness of some sort that they attributed their brain fog to. Of those people, about half of those, it was long COVID. Um, but then they looked at, well, when people are describing brain fog, what, what is it? What are they talking about? And so you can see, and then the size of the circle is basically how, how commonly that's what they were describing. So forgetfulness, poor concentration, inattentive lapses, um, those, you know, we, we definitely think those are cognitive issues impacted in people with IH. And so for some people with brain fog, they're probably describing their cognitive dysfunction from IH. Um, for lots of people, though, it's sort of more of a dissociative, not feeling quite real, not feeling quite like myself, just sort of feeling off. Um, that's probably different than the, than the cognitive piece of things. Um, sometimes it is fatigue. We'll talk more about fatigue in a minute, but we, we distinguish between sleepiness, which is like, oh my gosh, I have to go sleep. I sleep too much. I need to go fall asleep. And fatigue, which is really more of a weariness and a lack of energy, but it's not necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily prompt you to sleep. The, the solution to fatigue is not sleep, the way sleepiness, at least falling asleep is the, the consequence of it. Um, so I don't know if we asked everybody in the room to describe their brain fog, um, if, if people would fall into these bubbles or not. Um, I believe there's gonna be some, uh, data on that at the, at the sleep meeting uh, later this week and a conversation about brain fog later this meeting, which I'm really excited about. Um, but uh, a few months ago, a group of hypersomnia and narcolepsy researchers went and reviewed all the literature on brain fog and said, we got to at least come up with a definition because if we don't have a definition, we can't study it. And so they said, this is our first attempt at a definition to start the conversation. They said, it's cognitive dysfunction. It might or might not be related to sleepiness. It's almost certainly related to an underlying brain problem. It reduces concentration. It impairs the processing of information, taking information in and dealing with it in your brain. And then it results in this lack of clarity or lack of um, clarity of mental thinking and awareness. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that that's gonna capture 100% of people's brain fog experiences, but I like it. I think it captures a lot of them. 
The other thing they did in the paper that I thought was really interesting was not just talk about brain fog in IH and narcolepsy, because people with narcolepsy definitely get brain fog as well, both NT1 and NT2, but look across medical disorders, who else gets brain fog to try to understand what are the commonalities. And so brain fog turns out to be really common in some inflammatory and endocrine uh, issues. So celiac disease, um, lupus is a rheumatologic disease, thyroid disease. Um, there's sort of this ongoing question about does IH relate to inflammation in, in some way? We really don't know the answer to that, but it is interesting that other inflammatory conditions have a lot of brain fog associated with them. And then there's a whole group of disorders that people with IH get all the time, that people with IH have way more commonly than the general population. So that's things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, which is basically when you stand up, you can't stand up for too long because your heart rate does not regulate correctly. Uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, depression. These are all really common in people who have IH. And so it's interesting that like you don't just get brain fog from IH, you can get brain fog from some of the IH comorbidities as well, sort of get a double dose. Uh, and then COVID-19, of course, and long COVID um, brain fog became very, very um, commonly reported. About a third of people with long COVID looking at more than 10,000 people. So probably a pretty good ballpark have brain fog as part of long COVID. Um, it makes me optimistic that the better we understand long COVID, some of this might trickle back to understanding brain fog and maybe even parts of IH, but we'll see. It's not just medical conditions though. Also, there are some medications that cause brain fog. So chemotherapy for cancer very commonly causes um, um, chemo brain is what is often referred to. It's essentially brain fog as well. Um, interestingly, some antidepressants, um, can cause a sense of, uh, fogginess or detachment as well. Um, and then a cause of brain fog that I don't think gets nearly enough attention in the medical world is menopause. So two thirds of women undergoing menopause have brain fog. Um, and so that's not great. Um, I mentioned POTS, the difficulty of regulating uh, heart rate when you stand up. That is a function of the autonomic nervous system. And we know that people with idiopathic hypersomnia are more, like to more likely to have symptoms of dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. This has been shown um, in a number of studies now, but the study I'm highlighting here was actually done through the Hypersomnia Foundation website. Um, a plug for this study um, and, and the help of the HF for getting this study done. Uh, it was basically a, um, a questionnaire study looking at symptoms of dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. And there were three groups. There were people who, who joined through the HF website and said, yes, I have idiopathic hypersomnia. There were people who joined through the HF website and said, no, I don't have idiopathic hypersomnia. I can be a control. Um, and then there were a group of patients studied at Stanford and studied at Emory. So we could confirm the, the diagnosis of IH and, and make sure there weren't other things going on that would uh, cloud the results. Um, and, and basically, although the online people maybe had more symptoms than the in-person people, both groups of IH had way more symptoms of autonomic nervous system dysfunction than people um, without IH position changes. So I'm going from lying or sitting to standing, either a heart rate increase or a blood pressure drop, often leading to lightheadedness, sometimes leading to fainting, really pretty common in people with IH. The second most common autonomic nervous system symptoms reported by the IH patients were, were gastrointestinal. So um, those symptoms also pretty common. Talked about fatigue a minute ago. We really try very hard to distinguish fatigue from sleepiness on a clinical setting. Um, you have to be frankly sleepy to have IH, but many people with IH also have fatigue, that weariness, that lack of energy. Um, you can see some descriptors there from some common fatigue uh, questionnaires that we use. Um, a few years ago, uh, a medical student working with me went through our um, our research records and looked at in our people with idiopathic hypersomnia, not just how many of them had fatigue, but how many of them actually met the diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. So had both IH and chronic fatigue syndrome. And you can see what those criteria are there. 21% of people with IH actually met criteria for both. And so some people are not just 
uh, managing the IH, they're also managing the chronic fatigue as well. And, and really those impacts, um, the fatigue itself are part of the impact, um, but uh, and cognitive impairment and orthostatic intolerance also go along with um, chronic fatigue. Um, and then a feature of chronic fatigue that we don't think of so much as classic for IH is called post-exertional malaise or post-exertional worsening of symptoms where uh, if people do too much, they really are uh, incapacitated uh, for a period of, of recovery. I, I don't think in the literature historically, we have spent enough time thinking about not just the symptoms, but the impact of the symptoms on people's day-to-day -day lives. And I think that's starting to change. Um, the, um, the clinical trial for lower sodium oxybate used a, a measure of work performance, um, which was great. I hope more trials sort of follow in, in, that, um, in that way. Um, but what, what we do know about work performance in people with IH, again, I think won't be terribly surprising, um, is that it's hard to work when you have IH. The problem is less totally missed days, absenteeism, where you just can't show up at all. That definitely happens. Sometimes people are too sleepy to drive to work. Sometimes people don't wake up to drive to work. Um, much more commonly, what you see among people who are employed with IH is what we call presenteeism. So people show up, they want, they're trying, uh, but because their symptoms are so bad, they can't really fulfill the duties of their job. They're present, but not working to their full capacity because of their IH. I could probably talk for a longer time about this than I'm going to today. Um, but I think, you know, IH is a bad disease in and of itself. I think the way we have built society makes IH harder. Um, and just in terms of expectations of, of people and uh, how their job should be structured and so on, I think it's a lot harder to have an eight to five job with IH. You might be able to work those hours differently um, uh, more easily. Um, so the study I'm gonna tell you about to kind of make this point, this was not exactly the point of the study, but uh, this was a study of people with narcolepsy type one, narcolepsy type two and IH um, from uh, one of the French groups. So they're experts in these diseases. Um, and they basically asked people when the COVID lockdowns happened, um, which were you know, also fairly extended in, in France. Hey, how, how did you do with the lockdown? Um, and, you know, I mean, we all remember like eh, rough time in the world, didn't feel great. Um, a lot of anxieties. Um, but 43% of people with these hypersomnia disorders were like, oh my gosh, the lockdown was so good for me. <laughs> so I'm hearing that land with some people in the audience. Um, I've certainly had my patients describe this as well. Um, and it's because of things like I could nap when I needed to. I didn't feel as much stigma about my disease because I couldn't go anywhere, but nobody could go anywhere. And so it was fine. Um, I wasn't as sleepy. I was better able to sleep in the hours that fit with my biological clock. Uh, one that I heard a lot was, you know, before the pandemic, I was too sleepy to go out and get together with my friends. But now everybody does everything on Zoom. I can log on to a Zoom and hang out with my friends. Um, and, and so I think... Um, it's just sort of telling that it took this huge disruption of society to realize like these are the things that people with IH maybe would benefit from. And so the lesson I think to take forward from that, um, at least for me, um, is, you know, I think, I think sometimes people are very hesitant to ask for accommodations at work. And I think there's plenty of reasons um, to come at it from that perspective, but maybe some of what we need to be doing is like treating IH as best we can. And some of what we need to be doing is like changing people's work <laughs> schedules and getting accommodations so that they can get back to optimized disease control uh, in a way that the pandemic sort of accidentally did for us. I think the stigma um, around IH really contributes to the burden of living with the disease. Um, and I think the stigma can come in one of two ways. Um, I think when I hear the word stigma, I think of like 
someone on the outside is, is judging, right? Um, and that's certainly part of stigma. You heard it from Beth, right? Like if we could get rid of the word lazy from the entire world's vocabulary, I think that would be a huge benefit. Um, there's lots of negative perceptions of people with IH because of their disease. Um, but also there's a piece of stigma um, and particularly how stigma was measured on this in this study that it's also your self-perception. So negative self-perception about the disease, um, again, really trying to struggle to, really trying to be intentional about separating out, okay, this is me and this is my disease and not I'm lazy or I'm not able to do this, the IH won't let me. Um, so again, a, a study that I don't think is surprising to people living with IH, but there's lots of stigma um, related to IH. This particular study was trying to divide people with and without long sleep time, it's a problem for both. <clears throat> and then there's lots of comorbidities that people with IH seem to be at increased risk of having. Um, and I think those definitely contribute to the burden as well. Um, there are, this is kind of my brain map of uh, things that seem to go commonly with IH. So the chronic fatigue we talked about, the whole narcolepsy type two IH, are they the same? Are they different? Is a story for another day. Um, but certainly people shift between those two diagnoses. Mood comorbidities are really common in people with IH, depression, uh, anxiety. Headache is more common in people with IH, inflammation and allergy, potentially other sleep disorders or circadian misalignments, and then that autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And then there's a few things out there in the periphery. We're not totally sure if they're more common um, in IH, but we seem to see them an awful lot. Um, and so I think um, when thinking about managing IH, uh, I always have to remember, yes, I need to treat the IH, but also need to think about all the other things that may be comor comorbid and are contributing to disease burden because really the goal at the end of the day is get people feeling as good and as functional as possible. Um, what happens to IH over time, I think is an open question for a long time. There have been sort of reports here and there about spontaneous remissions, people's IH just seeming to go away without a lot of explanation or understanding of why that is. Um, this is a study that came out a couple, not very long ago, um, where they looked at people in this one clinic who had been diagnosed with IH and then followed up at least um, three years in time. On average, they followed up almost 10 years, actually. Um, and then they looked at what happened. And over the period of follow-up, 83% of people still had symptoms of IH. But of course, that means 17% of people's IH had apparently gone away. Their symptoms had gone away um, at follow-up. Um, but the point that this paper was trying to make was that of the people who still had symptoms of IH, um, some of them clearly still had IH and some of them had developed a new problem that maybe had explained the symptoms, maybe was contributing to the symptoms. They kind of said in this paper, well, so it was the wrong diagnosis. I'm not sure it was the wrong diagnosis, but it was an evolving uh, diagnosis. So the new diagnoses that developed during the follow-up were severe depression or bipolar disorder, severe medical disorders like emphysema um, or heart failure, um, and then sometimes severe sleep disorders as well. And so um, only a relatively small amount of the people who started out as IH, you know, at 10 years later still had only IH to deal with. One of the cool things about the registry that other people's registries don't have is that our registry, uh, y'all who are in the registry have been invited to do your questionnaire once a year forever. Um, and so we don't just have information on people who did the registry the first time. Um, we have people uh, who've done the registry a number of times. Um, and so we are still working on this paper and these analyses. So this is very preliminary, um, but since people in this room are in the registry, I wanted to uh, make sure and give you this update on what we're working at. So now we are looking at um, uh, about 320 people who've completed the registry at at least twice with IH. And so we had about 470 with IH did it once. So not everybody has done it um, a second time. Um, many people have done it more than twice. Many people have done it a number of times, um, but we wanted to look at people where we had sort of a first and a last, um, at least six months apart and it turned out to be about two and a half years apart. Um, and 
really there was not a lot of change in any of these measures over time. So um, the percentage who were on IH treatment, the percentage who were still sleepy, still struggling with brain, brain fog, um, still struggling with memory problems. I would have liked to see some improvement over time as people presumably continue to work with their doctors to optimize their treatment. I think there's a number of reasons why maybe we didn't see that here. I don't think it does, means that our medicines don't do anything. Um, but I think a lot of people joined this registry at a point in time when they'd already had the disease a long time. And so a lot of that optimization had already happened. Um, and again, we started out with like 470 people who did it once. And then this is only the people who did it at least twice. It's a smaller group and it may not be representative of the whole. So more to come on that. Um, but thank you to anyone who has completed the registry at all. Um, another study, which you're actually going to hear about, I saw on the program uh, later this meeting from Dr. Plant. Um, he uh, works with a great resource in the state of Wisconsin. So this is a study of employed adults um, who were employed by the state of Wisconsin that started many, many years ago. And they follow these people over time so they can look at all kinds of questions about sleep um, over time. And um, two things I want to highlight from this study, and then I'll let him talk about it more next time. The first is they used a very appropriate method to diagnose IH. They would have met, they had MSLTs, so they had the in-lab sleep study, and they ruled out other conditions, and they did the whole thing that we would do to diagnose it. Um, and the percentage of people who met criteria for IH were employed by the state of Wisconsin was one and a half percent. So... <laughs> Every review article that I've ever read about IH starts with a sentence, IH is a rare neurologic disease. <laughs> I'm actually not sure the word rare is true. Um, if it's one and a half percent of state employees in Wisconsin, I don't think that's particularly rare. I think people don't get diagnosed. These were not people who were diagnosed with IH. I think we have a big problem in that there's lots of people suffering with IH who have not made it to medical care. Um, but anyway, I think we should maybe start pushing back gently on the idea that IH is rare. The other thing that I, um, I just want to highlight from this study is that scatter plot. So that's each individual person in the study who had IH. And then it is time going um, on the x-axis and on the y-axis, it's their Epworth sleepiness. They're self-reported. How likely are you to doze off in these situations? Um, and you can see they're all over the map. So it's not like there is one trajectory. There's lots of different trajectories of IH. So um, just want to talk a little bit about treatments for IH and what we know. There's going to be more this weekend on treatments for IH too. So it's not like I have to cover the whole topic, but sort of what we know about these symptoms and their impacts um, re with respect to treatment. So I like to think about IH treatment in four different buckets of medications. The first bucket is what's FDA approved for IH. Right now today, there's one drug in that bucket, but hopefully soon that'll be a big, big bucket full of lots of options. Um, then the American Academy of Sleep Medicine puts out recommendations to doctors and says, here's the current evidence based on the evidence that's available. Here's what we think you should use to treat disease X, Y, or Z. And so we did one of those on idiopathic hypersomnia a few years ago. And so there's drugs that fall into that bucket. Often what we do to treat IH is take medicines that are FDA approved for narcolepsy and assume they will work for IH and use them for IH. This makes a lot of sense to me since the FDA doesn't distinguish between narcolepsy type one and narcolepsy type two. So lots of those medicines we already know work in narcolepsy type two. So they're probably gonna help in IH. Um, and then I have another bucket of sort of miscellaneous things that are potentially helpful. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about in the sleepiness column, like whenever we study a medicine for IH, whenever we write a paper about a medication for IH, even if it's not a clinical trial, everybody talks about sleepiness. <laughs> and so that is well studied. But what I want to draw your attention to is on everything after the first column, there's just a lot of open spaces. And there's open spaces because these are questions where no one has asked the question yet. So we do okay on studies of IH looking at sort of disease severity or quality of life. That's done sometimes. Uh, we do okay on sleep inertia. We're starting to look at sleep inertia in IH trials finally, but things like cognition, fatigue, driving safety, work and school performance, really these are things that we have not historically looked at that are so, so important. Um, so anyway, that gives you a sense of like what we know and what we don't know. The yes, probably, and sometimes, um, are sort of my, um, my take on the, 
on the evidence, the yeses come from big randomized placebo controlled trials. So we're pretty confident in them. And then the others are sort of less certain evidence. So uh, anyway, a lot of work to do um, in, in treating um, and figuring out which medicines treat which impacts of IH treatment, but uh, it, is, it is happening and ongoing. So um, with that, thank you so much. I probably did not leave myself time to take any questions, but thanks for your attention.